Welcome to the introduction to special education in module one. This is what um, you're typically going to see in a weekly module is some brief videos um, like you'll watch right now that really get into more of the detail that maybe is missing in the chapter or really making some, some key points that I want you to know, connecting to things outside of the textbook on what you're learning about. So today what I want to really look at is the history of special education in this video. It's one of the things that the text um, touches on briefly, but not in a lot of detail. And I think it's important for us to just have a, a good understanding of kind of where we came from and how we got to this point in terms of what special education looks like in schools uh, today. So what we want to look at in this module is we're going we're gonna to look at the history of special education, some of the laws that have come into effect that have really impacted how our students with disabilities uh, learn in the classroom, what kind of access do they have in the classroom, and then we're going to look at those six principles of IDA, and I'm just going to touch on some really important key things within each of those that I really want to make sure that you know and know well as you finish up this module. So let's look at the history of special education. I'm always amazed when I look back at um, the dates of the laws that were passed that have really impacted our students with disabilities, because to me, um, even at my age, it doesn't seem that long ago that the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 was passed. I mean, when we really think about that, before 1973, our students with disabilities really didn't have very many rights when it came to what kind of access they had in public schools. Um, <clears throat> for example, I was listening to a podcast the other day of um, one of the Shrivers who was involved in the development of Special Olympics, you know, that family developed Special Olympics because they had a sibling that was born in uh, the early 1920s that had an intellectual disability. And at the time that she was born, during the, the 20s, um, her parents were told, you know, there's no place for her to go to school. There's really nothing you can do with her except she can stay at home or you can put her in an institution. And those were the options that you had when you had a child with disability. And so she spent... Um, time at home with her parents trying to do therapies, um, provide her with some resources, those kinds of things. And that was a family that had a lot of money and those were their options. So you can imagine families um, who were not as well off, the kind of options that they had when they had a child with a disability, um, even leading up to the early 70s. It's pretty hard to believe. Schools that were not required to educate those students. So, in 1973, as part of the Civil Rights Movement, the Rehabilitation Act was passed, and this really gave all people with disabilities, um, it required schools to provide accommodations, okay? So that was really the first time that schools were impacted by the Civil Rights Movement in terms of individuals with disabilities. Then in 1975, uh, the federal government took that a step further, passing uh, what's really known as PL 94142, or the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, EHA. Okay, that was passed in 1975. That really established language that schools had to follow that guaranteed, and not only guaranteed, but enforced the right of children with disabilities to receive a free and appropriate public education. That was the first time that we saw FAPE used within a law, so that free and appropriate public education, meaning that um, whatever services students were required to need because of their disability to give them access to their education that had to be provided by the school free of charge. And they also had to have an appropriate education. Now we've, over the years, we've looked at what does that term appropriate mean and how do we define that? What does that look like in the schools? That's something that's always changing a little bit. Um, but that was the first time in 1975 that we saw FAPE really defined. Then, we have a pretty broad uh, range of years there that FAPE and PL 94142 were really being implemented. Then in 1997, the Individuals with Disabilities Act was written, and this really emphasized the individualness of students' services. And so, came up with establishing the use of IEPs, those individual education plans, really initiated the use of transition plans for the first time. We hadn't in the past been required to have transition plans. And it also tied funding to what services the schools were providing. So 
if schools were going to receive funds from the federal government for education purposes, they had to provide special education to children who qualified with disabilities. The other thing that um, the Individuals with Disabilities Act of 1997 really did was it expanded that coverage from birth to three for individuals with disabilities. So typically in the past, before 97, before the age of three, before they walked into that preschool classroom, there really weren't services that were uh, federally required to be provided. And so um, in 1997, we started being required to provide those services birth to three, which is important because research really shows us that early intervention is critical. You know, the, the more we provide early intervention to, to infants, toddlers with disabilities, whether that be a language disability, a learning disability, an intellectual disability, whatever it is, whatever is impacting their development, if we provide that early intervention, we know down the road that's going to have a much larger impact than if we wait until the age of three to be providing those interventions. And so I think it's just good for us as special educators to know where we came from, to remember what our history tells us. And it also I always felt like as a teacher, it helped me keep in mind what are things I'm doing in the classroom, doing with my students, that is maybe preventing them from having the best access to um, a free and appropriate public education or the best access for their learning. You know, you think in 1997, schools probably felt like they were doing good things with students with disabilities. They were, they were serving them well, but we still needed to improve. And I think that's a, a, the lesson learned here is there's always room for improvement, always room to really look at are we providing the best access to quality education for our students with disabilities. Another critical component that the authors mention in this, and I really like this, they, they start the chapter really with this, talking about language and how do we talk about individuals with disabilities. And I think this is really important for us all to be aware of and for us to promote in our buildings is really using a person-first language. And so not identifying that child as the disability, but identifying them by name first. And so it really allows us to to have a more positive, objective view of students, right? So for example, my daughter Josie is deaf, okay? I would not call her um, a deaf student. I would call her a student with deafness, okay? Because she, she does not identify initially with her deafness. Now, if you ask her, some days she does, okay? Because she's very proud of her deafness. Um, or she has low muscle tone. I don't, I don't identify her first as, as having that or she's a tubey, she's uh, fed through a feeding tube. We don't identify her first as a tubey. We identify her as Josie, and she's Josie with a tube, or Josie with low muscle tone. I think it's important that as special educators, we really use this language. We use it when we're around parents, we use it when we're around colleagues, so that our colleagues uh, in schools start to really use person-first language. I know as a parent, it always, um, I. It, it brings attention to me when I hear someone talk about Josie, not in person first language, but talk about her first as having a disability. And that always stings a little bit as a parent. Um, and I know that's not our intention if we don't use person first language. It's just a good practice to use, is to really identify that student by their name first, or as a student or as a child, and then with the disability second. One of the things that the textbook lays out here is kind of the span of special education. And remember, we talked about um, the Individuals with Disabilities Act of 1997 really putting in place that Part C, that Birth to Three program. The Birth to Three program um, covers students until they reach the age of three, and then they pick up services with their school district. And the Birth to Three program, Part C, also has an individualized education plan, it's called, actually called um, a fam Family Individualized uh, Service Plan. So FISP is what it is called. And it really, that Birth to Three program really encompasses the family more than the IEP does because services are typically provided in the home. So you have service providers, whether that's PT, OT, speech coming into the home 
or maybe into a daycare setting, maybe um, kiddos who are maybe two or in a, some kind of little preschool classroom setting during the week, service providers could go into that setting and provide those services. But it's really more of a family centered approach to providing services on those kiddos birth to three. Now once, once they reach three, um, they transition into their public school and they become part of um, part B, which is that ages three to 21 years. And so K to 12 schools are required to provide services if the student qualifies up to the age of 21. So sometimes we'll see kids that transition um, maybe out of their senior year and maybe transition into a life skills, work-based program that they stay in until they're 21, um, which is a really great opportunity for those kids to continue to develop those independent uh, living skills, those work skills, um, some of those things. And so that's why um, Individuals with Disabilities Act of 97 um, really included that Part B 3 to 21 years because it is important for us to have some flexibility there that those services don't necessarily end um, at 18 um, if they require additional supports. So most of you are going to be sitting in that Part B uh, section. I think it's just important to know that some of your families are going to be coming from uh, that birth to three family experience where it's more family centered and family focused. 